decisionally owned day. The employer must adduce proof of actual involvement in the alleged misconduct for loss of trust and confidence to wait in the dismissal of fiduciary rank and file employees. However, mere existence of a basis for believing that the employee has breached the trust and confidence of the employer is sufficient for managerial employees. Point one. Through this petition for review to Yolando T. Bravo, Bravo, challenges the decision 3 dated January 31, 2011 and resolution 4 dated July 14, 2011 of the Court of Appeals in CAG.RSB No. 02407 Min. The Court of Appeals reinstated the Executive Labor Arbiter's decision, which upheld petitioner's dismissal from service. 5. Bravo was employed as a part-time teacher 6 in 1988 by Urios College, now called Father Satumano Urios L. J. Never City. Point 7. In addition to his duties as a part-time teacher, Bravo was designated as the school's controller from June 1, 2002 to May 31, 2000, and 2.8. Urios College organized a committee to formulate a new ranking system for non-academic employees for school year 2001-2002. The committee was composed of the Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Aldifa Youngo, the Human Resources Department Head, Attorney Joseph C. Sorotai, and the Vice President for Administration, Dr. Wilma Balmasana. You enter the proposed ranking system, the position of controller was classified as an office HEAD while the position of Vice President for Finance was classified as M. Middle M. Management 9. The proposed ranking system for school year 2001 to 2002 was presented to Bravo for comments. 10. Bravo recommended that the position of controller should be classified as a middle management position because it was informally merged with the position of VISP resident for Air Finance 11. In addition, the controller and the vice president for finance performed similar functions, which included follow-up of payroll preparation, verification of daily cash vouchers, and certification of checks issued by the school. Moreover, they were responsible for the control of checkbooks issuance to the cashier, preparation of departmental budget guidelines, supervision of reports and payments to various government agencies, and analysis and interpretation of financial statements. Point 12 Bravo further suggested that since he assumed the duties of controller and vice president for finance, his salary scale should be upgraded. The committee allegedly agreed with Bravo and accepted his recommendations. 14 Bravo was then directed to arrange a salary adjustment schedule for the new ranking system. 15 later, Bravo obtained his employee ranking slip which showed his evaluation score and the change of his rank from office head to middle manager level 4. 16 the change, however, was merely superimposed. The employee ranking slip bore the signatures of the Human Resources Department head, the Vice President for Administration, and the President of Urios College. Point 17 The implementation of the new ranking system for non-academic employees and administrators for school year 2001-2002 and the corresponding schedule of salary adjustments were reflected on the October 15, 2001 payroll. This was opposed by several individuals within the school. Point 18 Urios College formed another committee to adopt a new ranking system for school year 2002-2003. After deliberation, the committee decided to maintain the ranking system used in the previous school year for school year 2002-2003. In the employee's ranking profile report, the position of controller was classified as middle management. Point 19 Meanwhile, Durio's College decided to undertake a structural reorganization. Point 20 During this period, Bravo occupied the controller position in a holdover capacity until May 31, 2003. He was reappointed to the same position, which expired on May 31, 2004. Bravo was then designated as a full-time teacher 21 in the college department for school year 2004-2005.22 in October 2004. Burios College organized a committee to review the ranking system implemented during school year 2001-2002.23 in its report. The committee found that the ranking system for school year 2001-2002 caused salary distortions among several employees. 24 There were also discrepancies in the salary adjustments of Bravo and of two, two, other 14 
Employees, namely, Nina A. Jurgo and Sherry I. Debata.25 The committee discovered that the controller's office solely prepared and implemented the S. Ailery Adjustment S. Schedule without prior approval from the Human Resources Department. 26. The committee recommended, among others, that Bravo be administratively charged for serious misconduct or willful breach of trust under Article 28,227 of the Labor Code. Point 28 Bravo allegedly misclassified several positions and miscomputed his and other employees' salaries. Point 29 On March 16, 2005, Bravo received a show cause memo requiring him to explain in writing why his services should not be terminated for his alleged acts of serious misconduct. The committee noted a discrepancy in the schedule of Salary adjustments, the implementation of which was entirely based on the computation that was then the responsibility of your office, controller. For this reason, you are advised to explain or show cause why your employment with Urios College will not be terminated for serious misconduct due to intentional misclassification slash miscomputation of your salary and some employees named here under, thereby causing prejudice not only to the school but also to said employees as well. 25 ID at 55 to 56. 26 ID. Two as community extension service officer then, Mrs. Nina A. Turgo belongs to office heads classification. However, in the schedule of salary adjustment, she was misclassified as office staff, which resulted to underpayment by PHP 2888.99 on her monthly salary. From June 2001 to February 2005 the underpayment is in the total amount of PHP 140,356.76. 3. Miss Cherry I. Debata only passed the comprehensive examination for Master of Arts in Educational Management in Urios College. This entitled her to PHP 500.00 adjustment in salary due to educational qualification, EQ. However, what is reflected in the schedule of salary adjustment is PHP 1000.00, which resulted to overpayment in salary by PHP 500.00 from June 2001 to March 2003, or in the total amount of PHP 11000.00. The foregoing actuations would necessarily affect your character as a teacher in the commerce program, and as an employee of the school, whose honesty and integrity ought to be beyond reproach to serve as role model for the students in this institution. We are therefore requesting for your written explanation relative to these matters within three, three, days from receipt of this memorandum. Documentary evidence, if there be any, may be attached to the written explanation. You may avail the aid of a legal counsel. Your failure to submit your written explanation as requested will be construed as a waiver on your part, as a consequence of which the school may take such appropriate action on the basis of the available records in connection with the matters made subject of this memorandum. For your compliance point 30A committee was organized to investigate the matter. 31 hearings were conducted on April 5, 2005, April 9, 2005, and once in May 2005, after which the parties submitted their respective position papers.32 in his position paper, Bravo alleged that he did not prepare the ranking system for school year 2001-2002. It was the ranking committee which categorized the position of controller as middle management. 33 The committee found that Bravo floated the idea of his salary adjustment which Urios College never formally approved.34 The committee also discovered an irregularity in the implementation of the ranking system for school year 2001 to 2002.35 Florida Liz V. Roserow, Roserow, of the Human Resources Department attested that Bravo failed to follow the school's I protocol in computing employees' salaries. According to Roserow, the Human Resources Department would prepare a summary table for each department containing the names of employees, their respective ranks, and the points they earned from their regular evaluation.37 The accomplished summary tables were forwarded to the controller's office, which would then designate each employee's salary based on a salary scale.38 when the ranking system for school year 2001 to 2002 was implemented, the controller's office prepared its own summary table 39. 
which did not indicate each employee's rank or bear the signature of the Human Resources Department head. Point 40 Bravo was found guilty of serious misconduct for which he was ordered to return the sum of P179319.16, representing overpayment of his monthly salary. Point 41 He received a copy of the Investigation Committee's decision on July 15, 2005. Point 42 On July 25, 2005. Durio's College notified Bravo of its decision to terminate his services 43 for serious misconduct and loss of trust and confidence. Point 44. Upon receipt of the termination letter, Bravo immediately filed before Executive Labor Arbiter Benjamin E. Pelles, Executive Labor Arbiter Pelles, a complaint for illegal dismissal with a prayer for the payment of separation pay, damages, and attorney's fees. Point 45 in the decision 46 dated December 27, 2005. Executive Labor Arbiter Pelles dismissed the complaint for lack of merit. Point 47 Bravo's act of assigning to himself an excessive and unauthorized salary. Rate while working as AC Optroller constituted serious misconduct and willful breach of trust and confidence for which he may be dismissed. Point 48 Bravo appealed the decision of Executive Labor Arbiter Pelles. 49 in the resolution 50 dated January 31, 2007. The National Labor Relations Commission found that Bravo's dismissal from service was illegal. Their 30 was no clear showing that Bravo violated any school policy. Point 51. Moreover, Bravo received the increased salary in good faith. Point 52. The National Labor Relations Commission also found that Urio's College failed to afford Bravo the opportunity to be heard and to defend himself with the assistance of counsel. 53. Urio's College was ordered to pay Bravo separation pay instead of reinstating him to his former position due to strained relations. Full back wages and attorney's fees were likewise awarded. Point 54. Urio's College assailed National Labor Relations Commission's resolution dated January 31st. 2007 through a petition for certiorari before the Court of Appeals. Point 55 in a decision dated January 31, 2011, the Court of Appeals reversed the National Labor Relations Commission's resolution and reinstated the decision of Executive Labor Arbiter Pelley's. Point 56 the Court of Appeals ruled that Urio's College had substantial basis to dismiss Bravo from service on the ground of serious misconduct and loss of trust and confidence. 57 Bravo occupied a highly sensitive position as the school's controller. I in the course of his duties, he granted himself additional salaries without proper authorization. Point 58 Rank and file employees may only be dismissed from service for loss of trust and confidence if the employer presents proof that the employee participated in the alleged misconduct. However, for managerial employees, it is sufficient that the employer has reasonable ground to believe that the employee is responsible for the alleged misconduct. 59 Bravo moved for reconsideration but his motion was denied in the resolution 60 dated July 14, 2011. Bravo filed a petition for review 61 before this court on August 31, 2011 to which respondent filed a comment on January 6, 2012. Point 62 in the resolution dated January 30, 2013. This court gave due course to the petition and required the parties to submit their respective memoranda. Point 63. Petitioner asserts that he acted in good faith. He insists that key school officials, including the Human Resources Department Head 64 classified the position of controller as middle management point 65 thus, he cannot be held accountable for the change in the rank of controller from that of office head to middle management. 66 Petitioner argues that suggesting an upgrade in his rank and salary cannot be considered serious misconduct. 67 He claims that he did not transgress any established rule or policy as he was duly authorized to receive the benefits of a middle-management employee. 68 Petitioner further argues that a dismissal based on loss of trust and confidence must rest on an actual breach of duty. Point 69 It may not be invoked by an employer without any factual basis. 70 Petitioner adds that he was not given ample opportunity to be heard and defend himself. 71 Respondent refused to furnish Petitioner the minutes of the investigation proceedings and copies of official documents, all of which Respondent had in its custody. 72 Moreover, Petitioner was not given the opportunity to comment on the selection of the members of the investigating committee.
73 on the other hand, respondent asserts that there was substantial evidence to dismiss petitioner on the ground of serious misconduct and loss of trust and confidence under the labor code. 74 petitioner failed to follow regular protocol with respect to the computation of his and other employees salaries. Point 75 respondent emphasizes that petitioner occupies a highly sensitive position. Hence, his integrity should be beyond reproach. 76 proof beyond reasonable doubt is not required in termination cases based on loss of trust and confidence 77 as long as there is reasonable ground to believe that the employee committed an act of dishonesty point 78 respondent contends that petitioner's right to procedural due process was not violated point 79 petitioner was present during the hearings and was even 64 id given copies of the documents presented against him. Moreover, respondent required petitioner to submit his position paper after the investigation. 80 The case presents the following issues for this court's resolution. First, whether petitioner's employment was terminated for a just cause. 81 Second, whether petitioner was deprived of procedural due process. 82 And finally, whether petitioner is entitled to the payment of separation pay, back wages, and attorney's fees. Point 83 petitioner's dismissal from employment was valid. I under Article 297 of the Labor Code, an employer may terminate the services of an employee for the following just causes. Article 297. 282 termination by employer dash an employer may terminate an employment for any of the following causes. 80 ID at 167. 80 To warrant termination of employment under Article 297A of the Labor Code, the misconduct must be serious or of such grave and aggravated character. 84 trivial and unimportant acts are not contemplated under Article 297A of the Labor Code. Point 85. In addition, the misconduct must relate to the performance of the employee's duties that would render the employee unfit to continue working for the employer. 86. Gambling during office hours. 87. Sexual intercourse within company premises. 88 sexual harassment 89 sleeping while on duty 90 and contracting work in competition with a business of one's employer 91 are among those considered as serious misconduct for which an employee's services may be terminated recently this court has emphasized that the rank and file employees act must have been performed with wrongful intent to warrant dismissal based on serious misconduct 92 dismissal is deemed too harsh a penalty to be imposed on employees who are not induced by any perverse or wrongful motive despite having committed some form of misconduct. Hence, in Moreno v. San Sebastian College Recolitos, 93, this court deemed the penalty of dismissal as disproportionate to the committed offense 94 because the employee was neither induced by nor motivated by a perverse or wrongful intent in violating the school's policy on external teaching engagements. Point 95 The same line of reasoning was applied in Universal Rubina Sugar Milling Corp. v. ALBAY 96 wherein union members assisted the 84 implementation of a writ of execution issued in their favor without proper authority. This court found that the union members did not act with intent to gain or with wrongful intent. Instead, they were impelled by their desire to collect the balance of their unpaid benefits, which the Department of Labor and Employment awarded to them. 97 Thus, to warrant the dismissal from service of a rank and file employee under Article 297A of the Labor Code, the misconduct, 1, must be serious, 2. Should relate to the performance of the employee's duties. 3. Should render the employee unfit to continue working for the employer. And 4. Should have been performed with wrongful intent. 98. There is no evidence that the position of controller was officially reclassified as middle management by a respondent. Petitioner's employment ranking slip, if at all, only constituted proof of petitioner's evaluation score. 
It hardly represented the formal act of respondent in reclassifying the position of controller. Hence, petitioner could not summarily assign to himself a higher salary rate without rendering himself unfit to continue working for respondent. However, it appears that petitioner was neither induced nor motivated by any wrongful intent. He believed in good faith that respondent had accepted and approved his recommendations on the proposed ranking scale for school year 2001 to 2002. Nevertheless, due to the nature of his occupation, petitioner's employment may be terminated for willful breach of trust under Article 297, C, not Article 297, A, of the Labor Code. A dismissal based on willful breach of trust or loss of trust and confidence under Article 297 of the Labor Code entails the concurrence of two, two, conditions. First, the employee whose services are to be terminated must occupy a position of trust and confidence. Point 99 There are two, two, types of positions in which trust and confidence are reposed by the employer, namely, managerial employees and fiduciary rank on file employees. 100 managerial employees are considered to occupy HT. Positions of trust and confidence because they are entrusted with confidential and delicate matters. 101 On the other hand, fiduciary rank and file employees refer to those employees who, in the normal and routine exercise of their functions, regularly handle significant amounts of the employer's money or property. 102 Examples of fiduciary rank and file employees are cashiers, auditors, property custodians, 103 selling tellers, 104 and sales managers. 105 It must be emphasized, however, that the nature and scope of work and not the job title or designation determine whether an employee holds a position of trust and confidence. 106 The second condition that must be satisfied is the presence of some basis for the loss of trust and confidence. This means that the employer must establish the existence of an act justifying the loss of trust and confidence. 107 Otherwise, employees will be left at the mercy of their employers. Point 108 Different rules apply in determining whether loss of trust and confidence may validly be used as a justification in termination cases. Managerial employees are treated differently than fiduciary rank and file employees. Point 109 in Cowell v. National Labor Relations Commission 110 IOI ID 102 ID 103. Although a less stringent degree of proof is required in termination cases involving managerial employees, employers may not invoke the ground of loss of trust and confidence arbitrarily. Point 112 The prerogative of employers in dismissing a managerial employee must be exercised without abuse of discretion. 113 Set against these parameters, this court holds that petitioner was validly dismissed based on loss of trust and confidence. Petitioner was not an ordinary rank and file employee. His position of responsibility on delicate financial matters entailed a substantial amount of trust from respondent. The entire payroll account depended on the accuracy of the classifications made by the controller. It was reasonable for the employer to trust that he had basis for his computations especially with respect to his own compensation. The preparation of the payroll is a sensitive matter requiring attention to detail. Not only does the payroll involve the company's finances, it also affects the welfare of all other employees who rely on their monthly salaries. Petitioners act in assigning to himself a higher salary rate without proper authorization is a clear breach of the trust and confidence reposed in him. In addition, there was no reason for the controller's office to undertake the preparation of its own summary table because this was a function that exclusively pertained to the Human Resources Department. Petitioner offered no explanation about the controller's office's deviation from company procedure and the discrepancies in the computation of other employees' salaries. Point 114 Petitioner's position made him accountable in ensuring that the controller's office observed the company's established procedures. It was reasonable that he should be held liable by respondent on the basis of command responsibility. Point 115 2 in termination based on just causes, 
the employer must comply with procedural due process by furnishing the employee a written notice containing the specific grounds or causes for dismissal. Point 116 The notice must also direct the employee to submit his or her written explanation within a reasonable period from the receipt of the notice. Point 117 Afterwards, the employer must give the employee ample opportunity to be heard and defend himself or herself. A hearing, however, is not a condition sign qua non point one eighteen. A formal hearing only becomes mandatory in termination cases when so required under company rules or when the employee requests for it. Point 119 Previously, a formal hearing was considered as an indispensable component of procedural due process in dismissal cases. Point 120 However, in Perez v. Philippine Telegraph and Telephone Co., this court clarified 121 the test for the fair procedure guaranteed under Article 277, b. Now, Article 292, b cannot be whether there has been a formal pre-termination confrontation between the employer and the employee. The ample opportunity to be heard standard is neither synonymous nor similar to a formal hearing. To confine the employee's right to be heard to a solitary form narrows down that right. It deprives him of other equally effective forms of adducing evidence in his defense. Certainly, such an exclusivist and absolutist interpretation is overly restrictive. The very nature of due process negates any concept of inflexible procedures universally applicable to every imaginable situation. Significantly, Section 2, D, Rule I of the Implementing Rules of Book 6 of the Labor Code itself provides that the so-called standards of due process outlined therein shall be observed substantially, not strictly. This is a recognition that while a formal hearing or conference is ideal, it is not an absolute, mandatory, or exclusive avenue of due process. An employee's right to be heard in termination cases under Article 277, b, as implemented by Section 2, d, Rule I of the Implementing Rules of Book 6 of the Labor Code should be interpreted in broad strokes. It is satisfied not only by a formal face-to-face -face confrontation but by any meaningful opportunity to contract over the charges against him and to submit evidence in support thereof. To be heard does not mean verbal argumentation alone inasmuch as one may be heard just as effectively through written explanations, submissions, or pleadings. Therefore, while the phrase ample opportunity to be heard may in fact include an actual hearing, it is not limited to a formal hearing only. In other words, the existence of an actual, formal trial type hearing, although preferred, is not absolutely necessary to satisfy the employee's right to be heard. Point 122, emphasis in the original. Citations omitted. Bank. Any meaningful opportunity for the employee to present evidence and address the charges against him or her satisfies the requirement of ample opportunity to be heard. Point 123. Finally, the employer must serve a notice informing the employee of his or her dismissal from employment. In this case, respondent complied with all the requirements of procedural due process in terminating petitioner's employment. Respondent furnished petitioner a show cause memo stating the specific grounds for dismissal. The show cause memo also required petitioner to answer the charges by submitting a written explanation. Point 124 Respondent even informed petitioner that he may avail the services of counsel. Respondent then conducted a thorough investigation. Three, three, hearings were conducted on separate occasions. 125 The findings of the investigation committee were then sent to petitioner. Point 126 Lastly, petitioner was given a notice of termination. D 51 D. 127 Contempt Respondent S Mod EC 1 S 1 On. Ordinarily, employees play no part in selecting the members of the investigating committee. That petitioner was not given the chance to comment on the selection of the members of the investigating committee does not mean that he was deprived of due process. In addition, there is no evidence indicating that the investigating committee was biased against petitioner. Hence, there is no merit in petitioner's claim that he was deprived of due process. Under Article 294 of the Labor Code, 128 the reliefs of an illegally dismissed employee are reinstatement and full back wages. 
Back wages is a form of relief that restores the income that was lost by reason of the employee's dismissal from employment. Point 129 It is computed from the time that the employee's compensation was withheld until his or her actual reinstatement. 130 However, when reinstatement is no longer feasible. DD 131 Separation Pay 1's Awari. 123 ID at 542. 124 Rolo. P59 125 ID at 26 126 ID at 71 121 ID 128 Labor Code Art 294 provides Article 294 279 Security of Tenure In cases of regular employment the employer shall not terminate the services of an employee except for a just cause or when authorized by this title. An employee who is unjustly dismissed from work shall be entitled to reinstatement without loss of seniority rights and other privileges and to his full back wages, inclusive of allowances, and to his other benefits or their monetary equivalent computed from the time his compensation was withheld from him up to the time of his actual reinstatement. Considering that there was a just cause for terminating petitioner from employment, there is no basis to award him separation pay and back wages. There are also no factual and legal basis to award attorney's fees to petitioner. Wherefore, the petition for review is denied. The Court of Appeals decision dated January 31st. 2011 in CAG.RSB No. 02407 min is affirmed. So ordered.